last week in Baton Rouge, I had made comment on the clock how we had a uh, difficulty uh, because it was flashing two alternating uh, things. Uh, well, it uh, resolved that problem. All it's got is nine up here. So uh, I'm not sure what that means. We do have another one, though. We, we have two. Uh, one's a, black, uh, a backup for the other. So it's a course, unless you're in a hurry to go for lunch, you're, you, you know, you, you really don't have anywhere else to go anyway, do you? Maybe home, lie down. We are here on one of God's festivals, a very special occasion, a very special day, the Day of Atonement. And in the aftermath of today, we focus in uh, very directly on the Feast of Tabernacles and on our preparation and anticipation for that festival. And the two are very much tied together. Ancient Jewish rabbis had a saying that the joy of tabernacles was the fruit of Kippur. Now, Day of Atonement in Hebrew is Yom Kippur. Uh, that's uh, the term the Jews most frequently use. It is uh, simply the Hebrew words that translated into English mean Day of Atonement. But they had a saying that the joy of tabernacles was the fruit of Kippur, the fruit of the Day of Atonement. That it was the result and the consequence of the Day of Atonement that made possible the joy, that festive, rejoicing time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And that is a very true, very accurate statement, one that I hope that we can more fully understand uh, even today, because I would like for us to understand more clearly today why that must be so, why it is only in the aftermath of atonement that we can celebrate the joy of the Feast of Tabernacles. In other words, why do we have to fast before we can feast? Because it is very directly tied in, in this holy day that we're here to celebrate, celebrating this Day of Atonement as a prelude to our celebration of the week-long Feast of Tabernacles and then that final eighth day, that great day, that last day that symbolizes the culmination of the very plan of God. So let's look at some things about the Day of Atonement today and let's understand a little bit about how it ties in and the relationship of fasting as a prelude to feasting. Now, to begin with, let's understand a little bit of what atonement is. What does atonement mean? Our English word atonement uh, is derived from, uh, is just from what it looks like. Our English word atonement uh, is derived from the English words at one. And uh, the uh, meaning of the word atonement in English is something that makes at one. In other words, reconciliation. Uh, that which reconciles, which makes at one. Restores an harmonious relationship. The word in Hebrew that is translated Day of Atonement, as I've already mentioned, is the Hebrew words Yom Kippur. Uh, Kippur meaning atonement, literally in Hebrew, the, the original root meaning of the word, uh, had to do with covering. And, in other words, to the word kippur had to do with a covering or a removal of the effects of sin. A removal of the effects and the consequence of sin. So the Day of Atonement focuses in on our need to be reconciled to God. Our need to be reconciled to God, reconnected to God, our need to have a relationship with God restored. It is based on the premise that often by ourselves, we don't have that harmonious relationship with God, that relationship of harmony and of peace has long ago been sundered. You see, before there was a need for atonement, first there came an estrangement. 
a separation. There came a damage to a relationship. If we open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God, Elohim, is the Hebrew. It is a word that has a plural ending, and certainly the scriptures show that there is more than one individual that constitutes God. There is the one that we know as God the Father, who reveals himself as the Father throughout the scriptures. There is the one that we know uh, in the New Testament is Jesus Christ, uh, called the Word, or the Logos, uh, which is the Greek term that is used there in John chapter 1, verse 1, that in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. He was in the beginning with God, and he was with God, and he was God. In the beginning was the Word. He was with God, he was God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. So, right there in the beginning, two beings... The one that we know as God the Father, and the one that we know as Jesus Christ. He was not yet Jesus Christ, but he was the Word, and he was in the beginning with God that we know as God the Father. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. The physical universe was brought into being. Now, we're told in the book of Job that the angels of God shouted for joy when the heavens were created. So, we're introduced to the fact that prior to the time of Genesis 1-1, prior to the time that God created the heavens and the earth, God had already created a heavenly realm. A realm of various beings, some of whom we have information about in the Scriptures. Three of those beings are revealed in the uh, Bible, their names, as revealed in the Hebrew language, are Gabriel, Michael, and Hillel. Now, Hillel, you haven't maybe heard of. That's the normally we use the Latin term Lucifer, uh, which is uh, the, the Hebrew word that's, that's used in the Old Testament is Hillel. But the uh, uh, the Latin form Lucifer is what has been popularized, and we normally refer to that. But it is good to realize that Lucifer is not the uh, uh, original Hebrew word. In fact, if you notice the names of all three of these archangels in the Hebrew language, they all ended with the same ending, the E-L ending, uh, the reference to God. Uh, these were uh, beings that were created by God. God's very name was a part of their names. Uh, as God gave these uh, three great uh, spirit beings, created spirit beings, not on a level with God the Father and Jesus Christ, but very powerful created beings. Now, there are many, many uh, others, uh, thousands and millions of others, uh, but these are the only three that are directly named in the pages of Scripture. We are introduced to various things uh, about God's great plan. God created these angelic beings. We use the term angel to refer to the whole realm of heavenly hosts because they're specific groups uh, such as uh, cherubim or seraphim and, and various uh, terms that are used in scripture and that's not my point to get into all of that but the point is that God created a vast heavenly realm and then at some point thereafter he brought into being the physical universe the stars, the sun, the moon, the earth how long ago did he do that? The Bible doesn't say. Science says that it was perhaps billions of years ago, and that's certainly possible. What is a few billion years in the scope of eternity? So, there, there's no problem with that. Four billion years ago, fine. Six billion, fine. Eight billion, that's fine too. Fits very nicely within the scope of eternity. God created beings that were there, various angelic hosts, there, uh, how long time went on, you know, how long between the time God created the angelic beings and he created the universe? Well, to, uh, to begin with, that's a meaningless question because there was no time. 
You realize time did not exist until the physical universe came into being? Time is, is by its very nature, defined by the relationship of the universe. Time, to us, time is defined by the movements of the earth, its rotation on its axis, its revolution around the sun, uh, the moon's uh, revolution around the earth. These are the things that define time. Before the universe existed, there was no time. Time is created. And that boggles our mind because we can't even comprehend uh, the absence of time. But God inhabits eternity. He created beings that were created to be immortal. They were created of spirit. But then God brought matter into existence, and he brought into existence the physical universe. And over a period of time, because now time existed, you see, the physical universe was uh, in place, that one of these beings, whom we best know by the term Lucifer, was placed over a large number of the angelic hosts. Uh, some scriptures indicate that it may have been a third, uh, one third of, of the angelic hosts. And this would, of course, fit in. This is, there's a reference in Revelation 12 to the fact that one third of the angels followed uh, Satan in his rebellion. And, of course, uh, Lucifer, or uh, Hillel's name was changed to Satan. Satan is a Hebrew word. It means adversary or enemy. And uh, uh, it is a, a term, uh, devil is a, is a Greek word uh, that uh, means a slanderer, one who accuses or who slanders. But uh, Revelation 12 indicates the fact that one third of the angels followed Satan the fact that there are three beings who are named in the scriptures would indicate that perhaps uh, each of these three angelic beings was given uh, rulership over uh, one-third of the others. Uh, this may not be the case, but nevertheless, there's an indication of it. Uh, Lucifer, or Hillel, originally had as his position one of the two covering cherubs, Together with Michael, uh, he was there at the very throne of God, representing one of the two overspreading cherubs uh, that, uh, whose job was to be right there at the very throne of God and who had uh, a very high function uh, in the government of God in uh, terms of, of uh, their, uh, their office. There was instruction in the government of God and in the plan of God because God had brought these beings into existence and then brought a physical universe into being because God had a plan. We're told of various aspects of the plan of God that God's plan was in existence before the foundation of the world. Now, that ought to make sense to anyone who's ever been involved in building. Over near me on Old Hammond Highway, there is a building that is taking place. In fact, I think, uh, the company that Mr. Terry Richardson works for is providing the block. And uh, they came in and they cleared out and they dug down and they uh, set concrete forms and, and uh, uh, laid uh, foundational uh, beams and then they come up with concrete block. Now, you know, I don't know exactly what that building is going to look like. I can deduce several things from what I see, but there's an awful lot that I can't tell about it. But if I were to go into the offices of the architects, if I were to go into the offices of the people that for whom that building is being built, undoubtedly I would be able to look at pictures there, uh, even color drawings, that describe and lay out in detail what both the exterior and the interior is going to be. There are plans that are drawn out. There are blueprints that are drawn out. Uh, there are uh, pictures that are done from various angles. Uh, there are specifications that are drawn up. Before the foundation of that building was ever laid and the first block was ordered, there was a plan. There was a plan about the purpose of the building. There was a plan about what the building was to be like. It was all designed. And then that design was made reality. So it is with the plan of God. 
God had a plan in mind. God knew where he was going. God set in motion a great plan, and he brought into being the physical universe. Lucifer and one-third of the angels were placed upon this planet, the earth, some point after the universe was brought into being, and they were placed here to administer God's government. It was a training ground for them, and they were given opportunity of preparing uh, this earth to have a part in the furthering of God's plan. There was a period of time that went by, again, science tells us that we're perhaps looking at several billion years, and there's no problem with that. That certainly uh, would not have uh, in any way stood in the way of uh, the angelic beings that were here. But one thing we know uh, about the earth under the administration of Lucifer, we know that from an early period, the government of God was not faithfully executed. Now, we know that for several reasons. One is the physical record that we have under our feet. Because as the progression goes along and the physical records of geology and later archaeology, as it progresses, we come upon creatures that existed by preying upon other creatures. Uh, various forms of dinosaurs, various forms of, uh, of living creatures that uh, lived and survived by preying upon other creatures. We come even into the scope of some of the early uh, hominids or man-like creatures, not man in the sense of the family of Adam, because, uh, uh, but rather uh, various creatures, creatures that don't exist today, uh, creatures that were more sophisticated, more highly developed, had greater brain power than uh, uh, any of the chimpanzees that exist, but were without that component of the spirit of man. They were not man uh, of the family of Adam, but were rather uh, various creatures of levels of intelligence that were certainly subject to the influence of the spirit realm around them. And the archaeological record shows that there was violence, that there was uh, every sort of what we term animalistic behavior uh, that existed, and there was destruction. Well, this is the record of geology and archaeology. The book of Acts tells us that when Jesus Christ returns, he will bring about the restitution of all things. And we're told that that is going to be a time of restoring, a time of, of restitution, of making things back the way they were and were intended to be. What is it going to be like, that time in the future? Well, in the book of Isaiah, we're told it will be a time in which they will neither hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. They will not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. We're told it's a time when the ox will eat straw, or the lion will eat straw like an ox. The wolf and the lamb will dwell together, lie down together. It will not be a time of violence. It will not be a time of fear. If that represents a restoration of the government of God, if that represents the way God's government is to be carried out, it's very apparent it was not administered that way in the pre-Adamic world. The record of geology tells us that, and also the testimony of Jesus Christ. Because it's not simply the record of geology that we derive that from. Jesus said in John chapter 8, in verse 44, speaking to the Jews who were attempting to persecute him, he said, You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. He's a liar and the father of it. So we find of Satan the devil that he was a murderer from the beginning and he did not abide in the truth. Two things we learn. 
Now, who did he murder? Well, he didn't murder other spirit beings because they were immortal just as he was. But what he introduced was the spirit of competition, the spirit of murder, the spirit of violence. You see, he disagreed with God, the Father. He disagreed with God in terms of how could excellence be best developed. God had instructed and given Lucifer authority to carry out his government upon the earth, the angelic beings there. There was a result that was to be brought about, but evidently, at an early period, Lucifer decided that he had a better idea, that competition would be far better than cooperation when it came to producing excellence, that survival of the fittest was the way uh, to ensure excellence, not the ideas that God had. God, clearly, from the record of geology, God must have worked with the angels for an interminably long period of time, trying to allow them to see why certain ways did not produce the best long-term results. That's why we find various creations, and and then there is a layer of destruction. Uh, there is simply uh, a cessation, you know. Uh, the, the, take the dinosaurs, for, existence, for, for instance. There was a time when they just simply ceased to exist, and science uh, doesn't know why they don't e- why they ceased. All sorts of theories that have been promulgated. The point is, God allowed things to be taken to a certain point. There came a time when He said, "Look." You see, it's evident this is not going to work. Look at the consequence. Look at the results. These things were then eliminated and other forms of life were introduced in their place. It was not a matter that one form evolved into something else any more than one form evolves into something else today. But God introduced into the creation various types of creatures, creatures that had greater levels of intelligence that were a greater challenge to be worked with, that were more capable of being influenced by uh, the spirit beings that were here on the earth, the angelic creatures. But Lucifer became obsessed with his own ideas and the putting into practice of his own ideas, his ways of competition, of survival, of the spirit of violence and murder. And coupled with that, we're told he did not abide in the truth. He didn't like the fact that God did not agree with him. And so he began over a period of time not abiding in the truth, but rather undermining the truth, misrepresenting the truth, seeking to influence the angels under him, there came a point in which, finally, perhaps the creation had been brought to the point that it was very apparent to him that the next step was to take matter, place spirit within that matter, and to have a creature that was then capable of being converted and transformed into spirit as a very literal son of God, above Lucifer and the angels, above any other created being, because our relationship, we're made for a little while lower than the angels, but ultimately our destiny is far above theirs. Well, we know clearly from Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 that he came to a point where he rebelled. And he sought to ascend into heaven, to be like the Most High, to exalt his throne above the stars of God. He was cast down, cast down to the earth, no longer to be known as Hillel, which means uh, a bringer of light, uh, you know, God's bringer of light. It no longer to be known as, uh, by Lucifer, light bringer, 
but to be known as enemy, adversary, Satan. When we're introduced in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, we're told, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Then we're told in verse 2 that the earth became, and that's the better rendering, the earth became without form. It became void, empty. It became filled with chaos. I say that the King James translates it was, but it's exactly the same Hebrew word that is used later on in the book of Genesis where we're told that Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. But she wasn't always a pillar of salt. She became a pillar of salt. And uh, uh, God did not create the earth in vain. He did not create uh, the earth uh, void and uh, chaotic. Uh, rather, we're told uh, very uh, we're told very clearly uh, in uh, Isaiah forty five eighteen that God Himself that formed the heaven and the earth and made it. He has established it. He created it not in vain. The words translated in vain here are exactly the same words used back in Genesis 1-2, where we're told that the earth became without form, in void. The word tohu that's used here in the Hebrew language, it was used in Genesis 1-2, it's used in Isaiah 45-18. So we're told in Genesis 1-2, the earth became without form, it became void, it became filled with chaos and emptiness. Isaiah 45, 18 makes it plain that that was not the way God made it. But it became that way. It became that way because Satan and his demons, because that's what the angels that followed him became, when they rebelled and were cast back down, there was chaos and destruction. And that sets the stage for the events that we pick up in Genesis chapter 1 a time period of almost 6,000 years ago, when, within a one-week period, God reformed and fashioned the... Excuse me. When God reformed and refashioned the face of the earth and introduced new life upon it, some of the life that he introduced upon it was uh, were creatures that had existed a matter of a short time earlier, prior to the destruction... Uh, but this time he introduced something new. He introduced a man and a woman made in his own image, unique and different, distinct from any creature that had gone before. M distinct most of all because God breathed into Adam, and Adam became a living soul. God placed within him a spirit in man. Something to unite with the physical brain and to impart a sense of intelligence, a sense of connection to past, present, and future. God put the world, he placed eternity in man's heart. Man was set aside and distinct from all of the, the other created beings. You know, what, what, is it that, uh, what, what is it that separates man? From being able from, from other creatures, you know, greater intelligence, yes, but that intelligence is expressed in the ability to create, in the ability to have a sense of of eternity, a sense of past, present, and future. That distinguishes man from the around, because uh, you know, animals, other uh, animals, dogs, horses, uh, they can uh, exhibit. Loyalty. They can exhibit love. They can exhibit a, a range of emotions. Uh, they uh, they they can be trained to do certain things. You know, a, a chimpanzee can watch a man and sit down and figure out how to construct a simple tool. Uh, even in the wild, they, they've been known to uh, uh, you know take a rock and throw it or, or a stick and hit with it. Uh, they can. Uh, cons that, that's not what separates man. Uh, from the animals, because you can teach uh, you can teach uh, uh, an animal to do various things. I mean, you can teach a parrot to talk, at least to pronounce words. They uh, don't have, but there is a vast, distinct difference between human and animal, and that goes back to the spirit of man. We're introduced in Genesis chapter one that God placed the first man, the first woman, there in a garden, and He commanded and instructed our first parents, from whom all human life springs. 
He instructed our first parents and gave them a knowledge of his laws, gave them a knowledge of his plan. He placed them in a beautiful garden. They were not estranged and cut off from him. They were not alienated from him. Rather, God pictures himself as having communion with them, as coming and walking in the garden and talking with them and dealing with them. There was a relationship of trust and of closeness. There was an openness. And then we're introduced to the fact that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, Has God said that you shall not eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden? And she said, Oh no, no, we can have the fruit of the trees of the garden, all except for this one that's in the midst of the garden, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've been told not to touch it, not to take of it, not to indulge in it, lest we die. And the serpent said, You shall not surely die. Now, that was a lie. It wasn't true. But you see, we learned early on that the devil did not abide in the truth. He left the truth behind a long time before. So he then engaged Adam and Eve in a dialogue. Eve was deceived. We're told that Adam really wasn't, but uh, he against his better judgment, allowed Eve to do what she wanted to do. He engaged them in a dialogue, and finally they took of the tree. Looked, it looked good, it smelled good, it was pretty, and we're told it was a tree to, it was a tree to be desired, a fruit to be desired to make one wise. He said, if you want to be like God, the way I've got a shortcut for you. Because, you see, there was a tree of life in the garden. But evidently, there were some stipulations. We're not told exactly what God had told Adam and Eve. But he had told them they knew that there was a tree of life there. They were expelled lest they should take of the tree of life and live forever. But they had not yet taken of that tree. That was not something that was available, that was there. But there were... Uh, what all God had told them, we don't exactly know, except that the devil came along and gave them a shortcut. He said, you want to be like God? You want to know as much as God does? He's keeping the best for himself. Here is the knowledge of good and evil. Here is the way of experience. Well, he imparted several things to them. And one thing that we see very clearly in the aftermath was he imparted to them a sense of shame. You see, a little while later, they heard the voice of God in the garden, and they hid. And God said, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? And finally, Adam answered, and he said, I'm hiding. And God said, why are you doing a thing like that? He said, well, I heard you coming. And I was naked, and I hid. He said, who told you you were naked? Who told you that you should be ashamed? Who imparted to you this sense of shame? I understand there is a difference between the sense of shame that was imparted to them that got right down to their very being, the very essence of who and what they were. There's a difference between that and an appropriate modesty. Uh, that's not what's being discussed because uh, there were only two people, husband and wife, and God had been there dealing with them. We're not looking at modesty in the presence of various people. We're not looking at the subject of public nudity. We're looking at a sense of shame that was imparted. A sense of shame that got down to the very essence of who and what Adam and Eve were. 
the very essence of, their ma- uh, of Adam's masculinity and Eve's femininity, the very essence of who and what they were, a sense of shame, a sense of inadequacy had been imparted by the dealings with Satan. And that, you know, what happens when a sense of shame comes? A sense of shame makes someone want to hide. Shame differs from guilt, and that guilt is for, is is uh, has to do with what we've done. Shame has to do with what we are. You see, there's a way out from under guilt. You can repent. You can change. Uh, you can quit doing what you've been doing, and guilt can be removed. Shame has to do with a sense of what we are. How do you change that? Well, that sense of shame was introduced by Satan. It was a consequence of sin. And it produced a total estrangement in the relationship with God. In the New Testament, we're given insight into that relationship with God and it's being cut asunder. Romans chapter 5 and verse 10 tells us that if when we were enemies, you realize there was a time when we were enemies? If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. There was a time when we were enemies. Now what? Was God our enemy? Is that, is that what that means? Was God mad at us? Is that is that the meaning of that? No, the enmity was on our side. Romans chapter 8 and verse 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal mind is enmity against God. The fleshly mind apart from God. The carnal mind is enmity against God. You see, if when we were enemies, why were we enemies? We were enemies because we were going the opposite way from the way of God. James says in the book of James, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Because who is the God of this world? Who is the wicked spirit that works even now in the children of disobedience? The prince of the power of the air. Satan the devil. Ultimately, you see, it comes down as to whom shall we believe and with whom shall we agree. Will it be God or will it be the devil? There are two sources of information. One is true and one is false. In the book of Colossians chapter 1, in Colossians chapter 1, in verse 21, we're told, You that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. You who were enemies, who were sometimes alienated, cut off, separated, enemies in your mind by wicked works, Because we followed a way of life that cut us off and separated us from God. We're told that Jesus Christ, in verse 20, made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Those of us, sometimes alienated, enemies, in our mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Let's notice in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise and having no hope and without God in this world. 
coming on down a little further in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse, in, in verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. There was a spiritual blindness. There was a darkness. There was an alienation. There was a sense of separation. There was a barrier that was introduced in the relationship between man and God. Satan was the originator of sin. He invented it. It didn't exist prior to his invention of it. He brought sin into being. He willfully and deliberately chose a different way. Refused to be instructed and corrected, though God patiently dealt with him over a period of time that is so long as to boggle our minds because we can't even comprehend the level of patience that dealt with someone over a period of literally billions of years until finally he had become so hardened and so embittered that he was ready to completely rebel against the government of God. And at that point, after the earth's destruction, God brought into being things as they have been for the last 6,000 years and produced Adam and Eve on the planet and began the family of man that was ultimately to be an extension of his family. But God allowed Satan to be there. He allowed that influence to be there because once sin had been introduced into the universe, then everyone who was going to come was going to have to choose. A choice was going to have to be made. God was not going to give any other creatures eternal life that were going to live forever in disharmony with him. Ultimately, to Satan and his demons is reserved the blackness of darkness forever, expulsion into some outermost black hole where they will foam out their own shame forever, isolated away from everything and everyone. God did not propose to add to that number. He brought into being creatures, creatures that were mortal, creatures that could be worked with and shaped, creatures that could be changed, creatures that had within them the ability to change, not only to choose, but to change, creatures that were made mortal, that if they did not accept the right choices, could simply be destroyed forever and simply cease to exist. But man, early on, accepted and submitted to the influence of Satan. Sin was introduced. Man became estranged from God, cut off from God, alienated, and as the human family progressed and as the history of human beings went on, human beings became increasingly alienated from the way that God thinks. Because man has built his own civilization, he's built his own culture, his own society. He has his own ideas of right and wrong, normal and abnormal. We're living in a time that is increasingly alienated from God, cut off from any semblance of the truth of God and the plan of God and even that there is a God. In Leviticus chapter 23, God outlined the great plan that he had set in motion. The great plan that he set in motion to produce his family. That, that plan started with the Passover, with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That member of the God family the Logos, the Word, the one who breathed the breath of life into Adam, who came down and became flesh, and who gave his life that we might live. Because he paid the penalty. His life was far more than the sum total of all of human life. His life was given in exchange for ours. 
The Passover begins the plan of God. It begins the process of reconciliation. the devil sort of compromised. It involves man being brought back into an harmonious relationship with God. Man brought into harmony with God. That was made possible in, to begin with, that Jesus Christ gave himself as one sacrifice for sins forever. The Passover started the plan of God for the sacrifice of Christ and the payment for sin. Then that was followed by the days of unleavened bread, showing that once we have come under the shed blood of Jesus Christ and have accepted his sacrifice and payment of our sins, that we must then come out of sin. We must put sin out of our lives. That God spares us from death for the purpose of coming out of spiritual Egypt and coming to become his people entering into a relationship with Him. So we start with the Passover and with the days of unleavened bread. We proceed to Pentecost, the Feast of First Fruits, that celebrates the fact that God was going to call out a handful, an early harvest, in the great spiritual harvest of all mankind. He was going to call out an early First Fruits harvest. He was ultimately going to write his laws in their hearts and minds through the Holy Spirit and transform them, convert them. This is the beginning of God's plan, and then we come forward to the fall. And beginning on the first day of the seventh month, tying in with the beginning of the seventh, one thousand year period in God's plan. That the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. The trumpets are going to sound. The blast is made. And the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom that will never be removed. The God of heaven is going to step in to judgment. He is going to judge the creation. And that Holy Day, that Feast of Trumpets we celebrated just a matter of nine days ago. Then we come to the tenth day of the seventh month, a day Leviticus 23 tells us is to be a day of expiation, a day of atonement, a day that signifies the complete removal of that which separates man from God. There were ceremonies that the priesthood went through. The people fasted. And it looked forward to and anticipates that time of total expiation, that time when there will be nothing to estrange and alienate man from God. That sets the stage for the Feast of Tabernacles, which pictures that time of rejoicing, that time of joy, that joyful time when the kingdom of God will rule over the earth for a thousand years. A time when every man will sit under his own vine and his own fig tree and none shall make him afraid. A time when the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. A time when the God of heaven will make a feast of fat things to all people. Fat things on the lees, wines well refined. culminating in the day after the Feast of Tabernacles, that eighth day, that last great day, that looks forward to the time in the, in the conclu- after the conclusion of the millennium when God will bring before him all the dead, small and great, all human beings who've ever lived and died down through the centuries, who've never known the truth of God, will be brought up to a restoration of mortal life and given an opportunity for their judgment to be completed. An opportunity to be reconciled to God and to have their names written in the book of life. So there is a time of 
of God's plan that we find outlined in the seven festival periods, the seven festivals, seven holy convocations of Leviticus 23. Now, this particular day, this Day of Atonement, there were some interesting things that took place on this day. Leviticus chapter 16 gives the information for the priesthood, information that they were to put into practice and to accomplish on this day. Leviticus chapter 16 is the instruction about the Day of Atonement and how in verse 7, that two goats were to be taken and presented before the eternal, the door of the tabernacle. And they were to cast lots. The high priest was to cast lots for the two goats. In other words, appealing to God to choose which was which. One was chosen for the eternal, for Yahweh. The other was chosen for Azazel. The Hebrew word here is Azazel, scapegoat is an interpretation and not a translation. Uh, the, uh, the, origi- the origin of the word scapegoat uh, simply meant the escape goat, the goat that escapes. Uh, the word, because of its usage in English, because of its usage in Leviticus 16, the King James translation of the Bible, the word scapegoat has come to mean in modern English uh, someone who unfairly bears the blame for others, which is a total misnomer of what was originally intended. One, one lot was for the eternal, the other lot was for Azazel. It was for the goat that was allowed to escape or be taken into the wilderness. Azazel is a term that is used uh, to refer to Satan. And if you check it up in a Bible dictionary or something of that sort, they will... Uh, bring out the fact that Azazel was a term that was used uh, by the Jews anciently uh, as a reference to Satan. So one goat was chosen for the eternal, the other was chosen for Azazel, for Satan. The goat upon which the eternal's lot fell was offered as an offering for sin. Now first the priest, the high priest, had offered a bullet for himself and his family. Because, you see, he was also a sinner, and before he could intercede for the people, first he had to make reconciliation for himself. So first he slaughtered a bullock to make reconciliation, to make atonement for himself and his family. Then he took a goat for the, for the people, and he sacrificed that. And he brought, brought the blood into the Holy of Holies, signifying the very presence of the throne of God. And that was used to make reconciliation for the people. Then, that was not the end of the story. That was not the completion of reconciliation. Because what was he to do? This, we're told in verse uh, 20, that when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place, in the tabernacle, the congregation, and the altar, he was to bring the live goat, the one chosen for Azazel, to lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and to confess over this goat all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him, this live goat, away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, a place of separation. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Now, if we go back to the book of Revelation, we find that when Jesus Christ returns to this earth, When he steps in to judge the world, there is a reconciliation that is going to have to be completed. Jesus Christ has already offered himself as one sacrifice for sins forever. His 
blood has already been shed in payment of our sins. But, that's not the end of the story. Because where did sin originate? Who's the author of sin? Is he going to get off scot-free? Who invented sin? And who induced our first parents to sin? Who has led the entire world in a way that has separated it from God? Has brought about an alienation and a separation from God? has been the source of all the pain, all the sorrow, all the problems and the heartache and the headache that so engulfed this world. We look around the world right now. We look at the world in which we live. And all over the world, you've got pain, you've got suffering, you've got heartache and sorrow. You've got disease epidemics and famines, many of which are actually man-caused. You've got problems that are going on, great ethnic strife all over the world involving virtually every ethnic group on this planet. We've got it in the United States. A fracturing. You, you, you know, sometimes you may have even heard the word. In fact, it was interesting uh, hearing a commentator speak yesterday uh, make reference to, uh, he was talking about California and the University of Berkeley, and he referred to the balkanization of America. Now, a lot of people up until recently may not, uh, unless they'd studied history, may not have known what Balkanization meant. But the Balkans are that little place down in Europe where, uh, you know, per, uh, Croats and Serbs and Slovenes uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bosnians and Macedonians and uh, Montenegrins and all these others and Bulgarians and ethnic Albanians, and they're all fighting and squabbling down there. Uh, terrible fighting going on right now uh, in uh, uh, Zagreb, the capital of Croatia. The Balkans refers to that little area. It was all divided up by mountain chains, and you had all these little groups. You had about a dozen little groups, all spoke a different language. Uh, and uh, you, you take a little tiny country and you subdivide it into things uh, that are, in some cases, about the size of some of our parishes. See, it's like not only is, you know, it, it would be not just a case of Louisiana pulling out of the Union, but then, you know, uh, Ascension Parish separating off, and Iberville Parish separating it off, and all these other uh, parishes, and each little group, you know, and then pretty soon some of the parishes split down the middle. Uh, and, and this, you know, the subdivision and the subdivision of each little group. It's called Balkanization because it goes back to the area of the Balkans where all these little groups, none of which have ever been able to get along with one another, all of which mistrust one another, all of which want their own little, their own little enclave, which may be nothing more than, a, than one little mountain valley. But that's theirs. Well, we're seeing this Balkanization not only in the Balkans, because the only time they've ever gotten along has been when they've had one great empire that sort of ruled them all, stamp a, you know, big foot down on all of them. As soon as the foot's been let up, they go back to doing what they've been doing. But we see not only the balkanization of the Balkans, we see the balkanization of the whole world. All over the world. We see it in this country, but we see it all over the world. We see it throughout Africa, and all the, not simply in South Africa, through all the, the nations of Africa. We see it in we see it in Asia. We see it in Europe. We, we see it worldwide. What is it that everybody wants? Ultimately, what they want is security, prosperity, freedom. Isn't that what God promises? Security. He says, the time is going to come when every man will sit under his own vine and his own fig tree, and none shall make him afraid. His bigger neighbor isn't going to come down, you know, chop his fig tree down and use for his own firewood and pluck all the grapes off his vine and sort of leave him in a, you know, a bloody heap laying there. That won't happen anymore. 
Every man will sit under his own vine and his own fig tree, and none shall make him afraid. Everybody will have his own spot. All peoples will be given their inheritance. And none to make them afraid. None to come in and terrorize and intimidate and take away prosperity. God is going to make a feast of fat things. Of fat things on the leaves of wines well refined. Fat things full of marrow. The whole world is going to have prosperity. There's not going to be the hunger and the starvation. There's not going to be the want. And what about freedom? Well, the greatest freedom there is, is what we're told in Romans 8, that the whole creation will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. The world wants and craves the very things we're here to celebrate the fulfillment of at the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles symbolizes that time when God will make a feast of fat things. That time when every man will sit under his own vine and his own fig tree and none will make him afraid. It celebrates a time when the creation will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glory of liberty of the sons of God. Brethren, why don't we have those things now? You see, what we're told, the reason we're going to have it in the future, is because that will be a time when the knowledge of God covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. That will be a time when man won't be alienated and cut off and separated from God. The reason that will be the case is because when Jesus Christ comes back, we read in Revelation chapter 20, Revelation 19 talks about the return of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 20. See, in Revelation 19.11, I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dwit dripped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him, upon white horses, clothed in linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus Christ for returning to this earth. And what's he going to do? Chapter 20, verse 1. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, the great abyss, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. Then I saw thrones, and they that sat on them. These are the ones that lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, we're told in the end of verse 4. In verse 5, we're told that the rest of the dead didn't live again until the thousand years were over, but this was the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death shall have no power, but they shall be kings, they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. What's going to make that possible? Because Satan is going to be bound for the thousand years. The seal is going to be set and he will not be allowed to deceive the nations anymore. The author of sin is going to be held responsible. You see, the goat that was chosen for God was sacrificed and its blood was taken in to the Holy of Holies to make reconciliation. But then, Then, the other. The one that was chosen for Azazel had hands laid on it, 
And all the sins of the nation were confessed over that goat. Because ultimately, that's where the responsibility was to be. And it was taken by the fit, by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness and turned loose in a place not inhabited. Here we have that fit man, that angel from heaven, that's going to come down and grab hold of Satan the devil and cast him into a place not inhabited. A place that is described in Revelation 18.2 is Babylon the Great. It's fallen, it's fallen, it's become the habitation of demons, the hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. It's going to be uninhabited. It's going to be nothing but a great big nuclear crater. And Satan and his demons are going to be shut up in it for a thousand years. A land not inhabited. That's what makes possible the millennium. The time when the government of God will bring peace and prosperity. Why can't man have it now? Ultimately, there is a spirit that works within the children of disobedience. That wicked spirit, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works even now in the children of disobedience. Why is there no trust? Jews and Arabs can't trust one another, not even to sit down and talk at the same table. Here, Serbians and Croats can't trust one another. Now, maybe most of us in this room would have trouble figuring out what's the difference. But they figure out the difference. And there's a wicked spirit working there to stir up animosity and hatred and discord, to stir up a lack of trust. To stir up and to incite within the hearts of human beings everywhere. Human beings who ultimately derive from the family of Adam. You know, maybe you've traced your genealogy back. You can go back, you know, three or four or five or six, uh, or maybe a few, can go back a few more generations. You could trace it back far enough, and eventually you will, you know, in the white throne judgment, if you trace it back far enough, you find out that it all goes back to Adam and Eve. Everybody. Every branch of the family is just that. It's a branch of the human family. Ultimately, we all go back to two parents, Adam and Eve. And yet, within the scope of this human family, there has been discord, there has been distrust, there has been animosity, there has been resentment. There's been hatred and discord of every sort. Why? Well, there is a great spirit being who was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth. He adhered to an idea he embraced, invented and chose, an idea of competition, of competitive violence, survival of the fittest and the truth never stood in his way to advance that philosophy mankind will never be at peace until he's made to bear responsibility for what he started and until he is removed away when we come before God fasting we are afflicting and humbling our souls We're telling God that what we want more than physical nourishment, what we want more than physical food and water, is the spiritual food and water that Mr. Rice discussed in the sermonette. We're saying that what we want is something that stretches beyond the physical, beyond the here and now. We want what can only come from God. Isaiah 58 talks about fasting. It talks about the wrong kind of fasting. It talks about people who go through the motions. Who may be doing what it says, just from a purely physical standpoint. But the fast God has chosen, in verse 6, 
is a fast that looses the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. To humble ourselves, to draw near to God, to afflict our souls with fasting. is to draw near to the one who can grant us freedom from the bondage of Satan and his world, and who holds out to us the glorious liberty of the children of God. You see, Isaiah 59 tells us that it's not that God's hand is shortened. It's not that his ear is heavy. Our iniquities separate between us and our God. And our sins have hit his face. Sin separates man from God. God took the initiative to make possible our reconciliation. God is the one who took the initiative to make possible our being restored and reconciled in Him. God wants us in His family. You see, God says in Isaiah 66 and verse 1, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you build me? Where is the place of my rest? All those things have my hand made, and all those things have been, says the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and that trembles at my word. Him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, that trembles at my word. That's what God wants, a humble, contrite spirit. We come before God on this day as we seek to have a humble and a contrite spirit, one that is, is attuned to God and to His influence, and to realize that that spirit, that wicked spirit that even now works in the children of disobedience worldwide, that same spirit has worked, and from time to time still does work, in our hearts and in our minds to separate us and to alienate us from God. God has made a reconciliation possible. He took the initiative. And he's going to culminate that with removing Satan when he prepares to establish his kingdom, his government. That joyous time, that feast of fat things, that time when none will be made afraid, that time of glorious liberty, that wonderful time of the kingdom of God that is ahead. The fruit of tabernacles, the joy of tabernacles, is really the fruit of Kippur, the fruit of atonement. Because if it were not for God taking that step of bringing us into reconciliation with Him and ultimately removing the one who is the source of that animosity. There would be no basis of preserving a time of joy. In Psalm 49, in verse 1, we're told, Praise you the Lord. Sing praise unto the Eternal, a new song. In his praise in the congregation of the saints, let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with a timbrel and a harp. For the Eternal takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their bed. The Feast of Tabernacles is a time of rejoicing, a time of celebration. You see, God will take pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. We're here to humble ourselves, to afflict our souls, to look to God. As we anticipate the joy, the excitement, the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles five days from now. We need to not only anticipate and enjoy 
the physical celebration in which we're going to take part. But to understand that we live in a world that does not have access to God, does not know God and know His plan. A world that is in pain and suffering. A world that groans and travails. A world that does not stand on the threshold of the peace that it thinks is about to break out. But a world that really does stand on the threshold of peace that's a lot closer and a lot more real and a lot more complete than anything that can be imagined or believed. But it's going to be from a source that they don't grasp. As we celebrate the feast, we need to understand that we're celebrating something that is going to be fulfilled and accomplished around this world in a matter of years. But before we can feast, we must fast. To draw near to God, to recognize that it is only by that reconciliation, that restoration, of our relationship with God, that empowerment that can only come from God, that we will be capable of taking part in the greatest and most joyous time that the world has ever known. Truly, the joy of tabernacles is the fruit of atonement.